you have ambassadors that have come from various uh, various fields and parts of the transport profession. Uh, my my own background is as a social scientist. I'm basically mixing sociology and psychology, uh, and I was one of the first social scientists to come into transport planning uh, back in the mid 1970s when. The profession and the planning profession was very scientifically orientated. Everything was science, everything could be modelled, and there were very definite answers. Um, and when I came into the profession, for the first time, people were saying, well, we're planning for cars, we're planning for the growth of cars, but there, there are almost 50% or more of the population that don't have access to a car. So what can we do about that? And, and that's how I came into the profession, specifically looking at the gender issue, but also about poverty, about disability, and people who in those days didn't have access to a car. Um, but it's interesting to see the way the perspective has changed. In those days, the benchmark was having a car, and those that didn't have access to a car. Uh, in the modern age, um, things are much different. We're looking at reducing the dependence of the car, um, and providing equity and access for all. So in the changing emphasis, um, sustainable urban mobility plans uh, in the European context are absolutely essential. Um, during the course of the last few years, they are maturing from a very embryonic stage. Back in 2011, 2012, I was involved with some colleagues in some of the first ones that were done in Eastern Europe. Um, and like all uh, new innovations, they, they mature, they need adjusting, they need fine-tuning. Uh, and I think that's probably where we are at the moment um, with sustainable urban mobility plans. When, when we look at the maturing of sustainable urban mobility plans, I always, um, it, it's, it's one of those things that it's easy to criticise, but they're absolutely essential for cities to be able to develop a vision of what type of city they want for the future, and strategies. We live in an uncertain future, and therefore sustainable urban mobility plans enable you to sit down and try and imagine not um, looking at the barrage of technologies that are coming at you, but to sit down and say, what type of city do we want? What type of city do we need? Do we need this technology? Do we not need that technology? Be clever. Smart cities are not cities that are wired up. Smart cities are cities that take smart decisions. And you could be one of those cities with an SUMP. Let me give you an example. I was involved in the United Kingdom back in the 1990s um, in setting up the first travel plans, the first mobility management. And we set up an organisation called Travelwise, uh, supported by the Minister and the Ministry of Transport. Um, and in those days, the idea was that um, you wouldn't get planning permission for various um, uh, things on your development unless you had um, a travel plan, um, very similar to how sustainable urban mobility plans access, access finance. So this led to a first wave of travel plans. Uh, the idea was that you did a very quick travel plan, um, it was very cheap, very quick, lots of money for consultants, um, and then the travel plan, you would wave it in the air and say, I have my travel plan, can I have the money, and then it would go on a shelf. Um, and it went through this phase, and one would expect it to go through this phase. But over the years, mobility management evolved. Travel plans became clever. Travel plans became smart. Mobility management became smart. And now, the travel plans that you see implemented and integrated all over Europe are nothing like those first ones. So, my, my lesson is, you know, um, we're going through the early years of sustainable urban mobility plans and we've been through that early phase and we need to mature and get the quality of the sustainable urban mobility plans moving forward. And there are many, many initiatives in Europe at the moment to help you do that and to give you the advice. Over the last uh, half century, 
we've seen car ownership rise um, and we've seen it start to level out in many cities and in a few lucky cities car ownership is now uh, beginning to to come down um, and one of the interesting things we found recently from work in um, the European Create project is that whereas um, cities have started to reduce their car use and started from very different levels of car use they're all beginning to converge um, on the same position at around 30 percent of modal split so not only do we have what we call a peak car phenomenon but we also have a, a convergence and we need to try and understand why why that is why you can get cities that have policies based on uh, cycling copenhagen walking paris um, public transport vienna um, coming from different levels of high car use and converging on, on one level. And I think this is something that we, we need to look forward. Um, but it, it, uh, attached to that, um, what we've seen are three stages um, of concern. In the early stage where car ownership was increasing, uh, the concern in the planning profession was very much about vehicles. And in many European cities, it's still about vehicles. There is still a status to have a car and to use that car. So the policies were geared to vehicles. In the second stage, we wanted to try and reduce congestion, reduce car use, and therefore the emphasis moved from vehicles um, in terms of moving people, and moving people on whatever mode was the best mode to move them. And this is where sustainable mobility ideas come in. Um, and in the third phase, we're looking at the livability of the city, creating places in the city, better designed streets, so we've gone from vehicles to people to places. And of course, in your sustainable urban mobility plan, you don't have to go through each stage. At any one stage, you will have some policies that are, de that are developed still for, for vehicles on strategic roads. You'll have policies that are for people, where you're trying to change the modal split, encourage cycling and walking and so on. And you will have the third stage of policies, which are trying to create nice urban spaces. And I'm sure many of you, particularly the historic cities, will have good examples of this. I remember um, back in the 1970s, um, around 79, when I started my international work, it was very difficult to get information on what was happening in other European countries. And I remember giving um, a, a presentation after a trip around Europe to my senior officers in the ministry about urban rail transport that people would consider quite simple these days. But there simply wasn't this, this exchange of ideas, this exchange of practice. Um, now, coming on now, um, we have a huge number of uh, data sets, ELTIS, um, uh, platforms. There is such an exchange of information and best practice examples. So the ability of, of a city like you, when you do your SUMP, to pick on these ideas um, and use them and develop them in your sustainable urban mobility plan, all of the intelligence, all of the information is there to help you accelerate um, the pattern that I described, the three stages, because you don't necessarily have to go from stage one to stage two to stage three. You could start implementing stage three policies. One of the important things to do, which is a very, very interesting case developed by Transport for London and now being transferred into other some Eastern European cities like Tallinn, um, is, a, is a, a method called link and place where different streets are classified on a nine-cell matrix um, which allow you to say what is the function of that particular street. Well, is it a major radial, in which case we need a stage one policy? Um, is it a radial that we have to be designed as a multimodal corridor, in which case it's a stage two policy? Or is this a street that is in fact a place? It's a place for the community, it's a place where people live. And therefore, in that street, we're going to implement stage three policies. And so when you develop your SUMPs, this is a technique that you can quite easily use um, to jump across all three stages at once to get the right mix that you can implement in, in your city.
There is a lot of work in, in uh, recent years um, trying to change the behaviour of uh, people to move from their cars to, uh, to other more sustainable modes. Um, and a lot of this uh, is based on what we might call a nudge technique. Something comes in um, and the idea is that it's a new, uh, a new type of transport system or it can be an awareness campaign um, giving you a good message. Uh, and the idea is that that message will help you change habits, it will help you to move your behaviour to sustainable transport. Um, on the other hand, there is another uh, type of method, which is something that you might have seen on, on things like television adverts for cars, where you see a car on a glacier or in a desert. Now this is, this is somewhere you would never think of driving, and what that is trying to do is to appeal to your inner values and say, we're not so bothered about what happens on the surface, whether we give you something to try and nudge you to change your behaviour. We're going deep into how you think um, and what values you have in your overall lifestyle. And we're trying to influence those, because if you can influence those, then you are much more likely to get a response. So you have two schools. So what's the answer? And like most things in life, the answer is a mix of the two. Um, we need to think about ways to change behaviour, and this should be done by very, very clever messaging and marketing campaigns, where you have umbrella campaigns that are trying to deal with your deeper values, and you can have individual campaigns within them that target spe specific initiatives uh, that are going on. What we are finding uh, in recent years is that the old variables that we've used of age and gender and occupation and so on are becoming less and less effective ways of explaining changes in behaviour. However, what is becoming more and more um, obvious uh, is that changes in behaviour for mobility uh, map whatever generation um, you happen to be in. And we've done a lot of work with um, people who specialise in sociology and the social characteristics of different generations in society, right the way from the, the youngest, uh, 0 to 15, through the millennials, through the middle age, to the baby boomers, and the so-called silent generation, the oldest generation. And what you find is that there are different behavioural routes in each of these generations so that you can map um, what you call a footprint. Each generation has a footprint and a footprint is based on the values that you form when you're in early adulthood and we know that people who form these values in early adulthood keep these values through their lives and they influence a lot of the things they do including mobility. And what we've done is to be able to define eight behavioural routes um, that, develop, that show a type of DNA, a mobility DNA, for each generation. And you can show how each, the, 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 the mobility footprint of each generation changes. It changes quite markedly. Now this is quite important, because if we're trying to define um, in our SUMPs, mobility products and services for the future, we can use this to see whether new mobility products and services will be acceptable or not to which generations. And also, by changing uh, particular products and services, how the products can be amended to appeal to greater audiences. Over the last 20 years, uh, most of the emphasis has been on the cities. 80% of the EU population live in cities and the focus has been on uh, achieving sustainability, sustainable mobility in the cities. Um, and one of the things that has happened there is that most of the measures that we speak of are confined to city centres of those big cities. And let me give you an example. We're currently working with Copenhagen for the last two or three years, but the senior officer in Copenhagen is absolutely clear. She says, we are a famous city for our cycling uh, and our walking, but our city centre is fairly small. 
And if you go to outer Copenhagen and even beyond, there is still a car-based city out there, but it's not the one that is publicised. And this is, this is not just true of Copenhagen, it is true of many areas, because by focusing all of our efforts in our SUMPs on measures in city centres, the problems are being pushed out into the suburbs, but even more into the wider city regions. We've never taken on the wider city regions um, for, good, for good measure, because uh, quite often it involves the collaboration of more than the city authority. But the actual functional area of a city, from the city core to the rural area, is really the functional area that we should be dealing with. And so I think in the future you will see much more focus in sustainable urban mobility plans on this wider city region. Um, because that is effectively your growth pole. That is what we've um, defined as the area that you're trying to develop by using transport strategies. The 2016 initiative in Romania by the Ministry for Regional Development really was a leader um, in Europe uh, by setting up uh, a series of growth poles and each one undertaking a sustainable urban mobility plan. They were well resourced um, and have produced um, effectively a model on which the rest of the country has since uh, produced sustainable urban mobility plans. The ones that were not in the original set um, have gone on to produce their own. So um, in, in a matter of four or five years, the country now um, is almost entirely uh, covered with sustainable urban mobility plans. Um, now, I think what is interesting in that um, is that these plans uh, were conducted in a fairly standard way, um, whereby many of the cities uh, did not have uh, two, two major things. The first one was they didn't have a transport model. Or they had a transport model that was based on a transport plan that might be 10 or 15 years at least out of date. So there was the need to create a new transport model. Um, and whether, like me, you're a social scientist or you're someone who favours models very strongly, you do need uh, a model of um, the larger cities uh, when you are dealing with sustainable urban mobility plans. You need to know the logistics and how they're, uh, and, and how they're moving. And the, the, the key is the assumptions uh, that you put in. The other um, uh, aspect in those sustainable urban mobility plans was uh, the, the public engagement. Um, in many parts of Europe, the idea of public engagement and public participation in decisions uh, on uh, the mobility of citizens uh, is not very well developed. Um, this was reflected in the first uh, set of guidelines for uh, SUMPs. Uh, so you have, these, you have these two areas. The modelling, um, there tends to be a lack of capacity um, to understand and to operate these um, in, in cities. Uh, and, and my guidance on that would be that a lot of cities that really are lacking in capacity to do an SUMP or indeed to manage it after it's done, um, use your local university, work with the university where you have multidisciplinary skills that you cannot have in your own department um, and really work out a good collaborative win-win situation with your local university. They could operate your transport model for you, so that, for example, so that you do not have to quit, get parachute Western consultants coming in at great cost to do the work for you. When I came into the profession in 1975 as one of the first social scientists, uh, the profession, as, as most of you will know, uh, was based on, on civil engineering. Um, and of course, in building road infrastructure, bridges, uh, tunnels and so on, we can't do without our engineers. And, uh, and engineers play a, a vitally important role. Um, but from the mid-1970s, certainly in, in the UK, where I, I, I was trained, um, there began to be people coming in from a wider range of social science disciplines as the social dimension and the equity issues involved in transport uh, became more important. And we saw this mobility, indeed, across Europe was one of the leading indicators uh, between rich and poor. 
Um, and mobility is one of our basic freedoms. Uh, so in other words, greater numbers of disciplines were coming into the profession. Uh, there were new ideas uh, coming in about the environment. Um, in those days, this is pre-global warming, um, but, but concerns about air pollution, noise and so on, um, and habitat and severance and all these things. Um, so you had a younger profession that was growing over time through the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, but really with people at the top of the profession that were still very engineering orientated. Around the time of the mid-90s, the mid to late 90s, people in my profession, in my, in my, in my age group, sorry, um, began to take the top jobs. They began to become the decision makers. And at that time, you can see a, a marked change in the rate of innovation of sustainable mobility measures from the late 90s. So in a sense, the social scientists and the economists, always under the radar, came to the top. Now this doesn't say that the engineers are not important. Engineers will always be important in transport systems. Um, but what you had among the policy makers was a, a wider set of disciplines. And we can see that. And around the end of the 90s to about 2004, in the big cities, car use starts to drop. So this is an important issue. Now, coming to today's SUMPs, um, in any department, um, in most cities, apart from the very big cities, you don't have the resources to have a big multidisciplinary staff behind you to pull in all those ideas from psychology, sociology, economics and many other professions which these days come into the wider transport industry, um, ITS, ICT and so on. You can't hope to have those skills. Um, so what can you do about that if you want something sustainable for the long term so that you don't have to keep bringing in consultants uh, to, to parachute in, do something and then disappear? You need to build local capacity and the way to do it is to build local capacity in your university with courses on sustainable transport that pull in expertise from other departments in the university into a core so that you have uh, a very good sustainable transport module and a module that not only educates the younger people but is also a capacity builder for the local authority and the city regional authorities. And I think this is a way in which we get sustainable capacity for the future, which will help drive your sustainable mobility plan. When it comes to finance um, for sustainable mobility schemes, uh, and indeed schemes for developing more livable spaces and street designs in, in, in cities, uh, there is an issue um, with um, some of the funding, funding agencies at the moment, um, which I know in meetings I've had with them, they, they fully recognise the, uh, the problem. Uh, most of the appraisal uh, techniques that we use uh, are based on um, appraising schemes that were for infrastructure projects to do with roads or rail or heavy engineering, building bridges or light rail systems and so on. Um, this would be a standard um, cost-benefit analysis, social cost-benefit analysis, uh, perhaps with other factors being taken in, external factors being taken in, um, although the, uh, the bankers generally look for the hard cost-benefit. Cost uh, now, contrast that with a city such as in your sustainable urban mobility plan, where you've got a package of very small measures. Um, each one not at the level of funding that you require for a bridge or a, or a tunnel or whatever, um, but very, very important for promoting sustainable mobility in the area of the city that you want. Uh, you've, got a, uh, you've got a shopping bag of small measures there. Um, and at the moment, uh, we need to change the way that we appraise our schemes to, to allow these to come forward. Now, we're very fortunate uh, with the grants that are available through DG Regio that, that in fact, anything can be put in there. And, 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 but, but when it comes to going for loan funding from agencies such as EBRD and the other, and the other donor agencies, there is still a problem 
in, in, in getting that to a situation where there is a bankable project because we need to take in things such as health benefits, lifestyle benefits, um, and we know these benefits are absolutely huge if we can, for example, encourage walking and cycling and, and improve health. Uh, but there needs, there needs to be a way in which these are fed through into the funding mechanism and get more widely uh, accepted. Starting an SUMP uh, might seem a bit of a daunting task, uh, particularly if, if, if there are a few of you in the city to actually address this issue. Uh, but what I would say is that if you can do it, it will give you a framework from which to build the future. Start with the vision of the city. Start with the type of city that you want. Bring together the visions of other departments and look at the role of transport within that. And so you start with a very, very clear vision of that is the type of city you need. From that, you can start working backwards. Vision and validate. You start working backwards and say, well, how can we achieve uh, that vision of the city? There is a lot of best practice that's available that you can call on. There is a lot of expertise provided um, within the European Commission and the various projects uh, that will help you along the way. Use that advice, use that expertise, because it's there, it's there for you to use and you should use it. And the outcome will be something that you really, really can be proud of um, for your citizens in the future.